This is part two of infectious diseases. So when you do um, a culture, remember you have to do that before you start antibiotics. If you start antibiotics, you've just nullified the culture results. You will end up with negative whether it was negative or not. So culture first and then antibiotics. NP swabs, we do a lot of these at Valley Children's for um, flu, RSV, different respiratory infections. And remember, you're going nasopharyngeal. So it is not the mucus up here in the nose. It's the mucus back here, way back nasal pharyngeal, which is just above the throat, the oral pharynx. So it's sepsis. This is our concern when we see an infant with a fever. Is this systemic inflammatory response syndrome? Uh, which leads to septic shock. Shock means you get hypotensive, and that happens because of decreased perfusion because you get all that capillary permeability. Your leaky capillaries, fluid leaks out into the tissue, making you edematous, but intravascularly um, hypovolemic, which then leads to multisystem failure. Uh, highest risk for developing sepsis is infants under three months, those who are immunocompromised, and anyone with an indwelling catheter, so those central lines. So laboratory and diagnostic tests we're going to do in sepsis. We're going to start with that blood count. Again, we're looking at um, WBC levels as well as which type. The C-reactive protein, it's going to be up. Uh, blood cultures, if they have septicemia, um, that's going to be positive. We're going to grow germs from the blood. Urine culture, they may have germs in, in the urine as well. Um, what we're really worried about is meningitis. And if they have meningitis, what we're going to see is in that cerebral spinal fluid that they take off in a lumbar puncture, there will be WBCs, elevated protein, and decreased glucose. Um, we can, there may be stool cultures that may have bacteria or other organisms in there. We're probably going to culture any central lines, any tubes, catheters, or shunts that we think may be where the infection is coming from. And then they'll probably do a, a chest x-ray as well, looking for pneumonia. Um, so nursing interventions to promote comfort when we have a child with an infectious disease is assessing the pain, uh, and then are they responding to the things we do for it? So re doing that re-evaluation. Administer analgesics and antipyretics. Uh, apply cool compresses or baths to areas that itch, right? Kids are terrible about scratching, and then they get a secondary infection. So um, try and avoid that itching. Fluids. We really want to keep them hydrated. Cool mist humidifier can help if they have sore throat or congestion. Um, dressing them in light clothing. We don't want them unclothed because then they'll shiver and raise their fever. So just, but we don't want them bundled. That will also raise their fever. So light clothing, clothing. And then diversional activities. Find toys or games they like, TV shows they like, movies they like. So we're going to talk about some different bacterial infections kids get, starting with MRSA. So this is transmitted person to person. Um, so you catch it from someone else. It can be through respiratory droplets, through blood, or through personal items. Uh, so it in kids, usually what we see are some sort of a, a bump or an abscess, which um, it's just a little deeper, but it it has a head to it. It's got a kind of a central spot that's got pus in it, um, as opposed to cellulitis where it's just the tissue is irritated, but there's no scent, no real head. So that's what we usually see. Um, a lot of times on kids who are in diapers, it might be where the elastic of the diaper rubs around legs, um, things like that. So they will do a culture of the site and usually because this does have a head, it has a central abscess, a central place of that purulent uh, drainage, 
we're going to do an incision and drainage, IND is what people call it, to open it up, get that pus out. So then they're like, they may get a day of IV antibiotics, but they're probably going to be sent home to finish a course of oral antibiotics. So teach them to take the whole course, to use good hand hygiene, right, because it is transmittable from person to person, and to not share personal items, things like brushes and towels, things that have touched, you know, where if it's on the head or on the body, um, it's touched and then it touches someone else. Scarlet fever is the next bacterial uh, agent we're going to talk about, and this comes from our group A streptococci. Uh, usually this happens along with a throat infection, which we usually call strep throat. It's transmitted by droplet, can take two to five days for incubation, so from when you're exposed to you till you show symptoms. Um, somebody who gets this is contagious until they've been on appropriate antibiotics for 24 hours, so kids, if they're feeling better, um, they can go back to school after 24 hours. They may not be feeling well enough, but um, they can go out. They're not a contagious anymore. We've weakened the germ enough that it can no longer transmit from person to person. The best uh, antibiotic for this one is penicillin V. Um, so again, things we want to teach this is usually managed at home, so we want to teach people to take the entire course of antibiotics. We've, we're getting lots of resistant germs because they get exposed to antibiotics but not fully killed. Um, you want to maintain hydration Remember, fever makes your need, your fluid need go up, and that sore throat makes the kid not drink as much. So um, what we are worried about is hydration. Some things to help with that is soft foods. They probably have a sore throat. Things that are too scratchy are going to hurt. So soft foods, soups, popsicles, things that have a lot of fluid for them. And then a cool mist humidifier at night. So what does scarlet fever look like? Uh, this is... The characteristic strawberry tongue, and they get this fine um, flat rash. And you notice it kind of starts up at the head and neck. Pertussis. This is also a bacteria, uh, which means treat with antibiotics. Uh, whooping cough is the name it's often called because it has this paroxysmal cough. Paroxysmal means it comes and it goes, and when they're not having it, they seem fine, but then they start coughing, and they cough and cough and cough and cough till they turn red, till they turn purple. Then they finally take a tiny breath and go, Ooh! which is the whoop sound. Um, that is not an adequate breath. And then they go right back to coughing. The younger a child gets this, the higher the mortality rates, and when... Um, infants who are under that two months, which is where we give the first immunization, when they get it, they actually have a quite a high mortality rate from it. Um, incubation, usually 6 to 21 days. Again, you can see why we've got to ask people, what have you been exposed to in the last month? It's not just the last few days. These coughing spells, the bad ones last between one and four weeks and then there's a convalescent stage which can last for months so we send these kids home from the hospital when they can manage a coughing spell without needing oxygen but the family's still going to have them coughing for weeks to months at home um, there is an immunization for this the problem is that immunization does not last for a lifetime in fact it usually wears off about junior high which is why we are now requiring junior hires to get another shot. Uh, the problem is an adult just gets this bad cough with thick mucus that takes them a long time to get over, right? Your body can kill bacteria. It just takes a long time. But they aren't contagious during that time, and they can spread it to infants who can die from it. So um, we want to really anybody who's around um, an infant. If, when you have an infant in your family, everybody should get immunized again against pertussis so that you don't spread it. So the recommendation is uh, erythromycin, which is an oral medication, should be given to the child who's ill as well as all of the close contacts because they probably caught it from someone in the family. Here's what they look like during that coughing spell, and I had a, a YouTube video on there of a family who 
recorded their child um, during a coughing spell. Botulism. Again, this is bacterial. Uh, it can come from just spores in the dust. We know um, honey usually has a few spores in it, and past infancy you can handle a few spores. Your immune system just gets rid of them, and your gut, the normal flora in your gut, prevents them from getting a chance to really start multiplying. Um, but infants can't do that, so we don't give honey to infants for that reason. Um, most common reason that people, in the U.S. at least, catch botulism is improperly canned canned goods. So begins just sort of vague constipation and poor feeding and then it progresses to paralysis it paralyzes the muscles including the diaphragm so anybody with botulism you see he has a trachea a, a tracheostomy um, there is an antitoxin for it it's the toxins produced from that uh, bacteria that actually do the paralysis um, so we give antitoxins um, and you come back, but it takes a little time. This picture, which is off of the internet, the kid was saying he could hear everything that was going on around him, but he couldn't move and couldn't respond. And he, you know, after treatment, was fine. Takes some time, but he was fine. Osteomyelitis. So this is an infection in the bone and the tissue around it, right? Osteo meaning bone, mile is the, the muscle or the tissue, and itis inflammation. So infection in the, the bone and surrounding tissue. Um, usually the germs get into the bone from the bloodstream. So they somehow they get picked up from somewhere else, circulate in the bloodstream, and then um, lodge into the bone. We diagnosis by doing that blood culture a bone scan, but the really definitive way to do it is to do a biopsy, to um, do an aspiration biopsy of the bone itself. Um, they may or may not do that, but that is the way to really, truly confirm it. It takes a long time to kill this. Four to six weeks of antibiotics, usually that will all be IV. Sometimes if we see the CRP coming down, the clinical uh, presentations looking much better they might switch them from IV to oral but it will go on for at least four to six weeks um, of, of antibiotics initially they probably are gonna want bed rest uh, just to not spread those germs so I mean what happens is you as you can see here we've got pockets of germs get inside the bone they actually do damage to the bone tissue and some new bone then develops but you've got bone with holes and with new brittle bone um, in kids the good news is osteomyelitis can almost always be fully cured in adults it can almost always not be fully cured we can get it to a subclinical state but we can't totally kill it off because adults just don't have that much blood flow through the ossified part of the bone. Where kids, because their bones are still growing, and this usually happens um, near our growth plates, not in the growth plate, but near where we still have um, pretty good um, growth going on, so blood flow. Septic arthritis. Arthritis means it's in the joint, and septic means it's an infectious agent. So we've got bacteria that got into the joint. Um, most common are the hip or the knee, and most kids who get this are less than three years. Both osteomyelitis and septic arthritis, you're likely to see a kid who was either crawling or walking suddenly stop because it's painful, and that should kind of be a, a sign that something is wrong. Kids who have been walking don't stop walking. Um, the problem with this is it can do necrosis. It can damage that bone. Um, and if, so if it's in the hip, you can damage and get necrotic areas on the femoral head, even though the infection was in the joint. So our goal is to prevent that, prevent destruction of the joint and maintain full motion, um, and function and strength in that joint. So this is what a knee might 